and I'm going to bring the word today. Um, Jesus, thank you for your goodness to us, for your faithfulness. I thank you that you speak to us through the Holy Spirit and through your word. That your word does not go back to you empty or void, but it prospers in the thing for which it's sent and accomplishes what you desire. And so, Father, I thank you that you will accomplish what you desire and your word will prosper in our lives today. We open our hearts to receive the seed of your word, and I pray, Lord, that your word would be planted deeply in our hearts with deep roots and that it would produce good fruit in our lives, not 30 or 60, but 100-fold. So, Lord, we offer ourselves to you and ask that you would transform us and renew our minds, and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as we are jumping into the Christmas season, we're going to be um, we're going to be following Advent, um, which actually the history of Advent. There's other church denominations, um, the Orthodox Church. They practice Advent much more um, regularly than we would. However, we want to pay attention to the season of Advent, and the season of Advent Advent simply means that we are focusing on. The, the arrival, the anticipation of our Messiah, Jesus. And we're looking at not just the history of Jesus coming to earth and celebrating his birth, like we do at Christmas time, but two other aspects is that it's, it's the work that happens in us when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the new life that we experience, and then the hope that we're holding on to this side of the cross is the second return of Jesus, that Jesus is coming back for his bride, that he is going to return. And so we hold on to that hope. And so Christmas allows us to have a sense of anticipation, of expectation for who he is and what he has promised to do for us and who he's promised to be for us. So as I was reading part of the Christmas story this week, I was struck by something that I just had never really noticed before. How many times, you know, how, how, have, how has that happened for you when you read a scripture, you know, and it's something that you've read time and time before, and all of a sudden you have this aha moment, right? And you're like, I've never seen that before. I didn't know that. And yet it's something that you've read. And that's how the Holy Spirit works in our life. That's the dy dynamite of having the Holy Spirit and reading the living, active Word of God. The combustion of those two things, when they come together, we get the opportunity of revelation, where the Lord reveals something to us. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to just jump into um, the middle section of a story. So this is actually the beginning of of the Christmas story. This is when Zechariah has been serving as a priest and he goes into the temple to offer the sacrifice and he's having a time of prayer and angel zooms in, right? Surprises him. And actually, historically, when the priest went in to serve, they went in with some fear and trepidation because they thought that if an angel showed up, it wasn't for good reason. <laughs> And so they actually had bells attached to the edge of their rope because if the people outside the Holy of Holies heard the bells clang and clatter, they would think that the priests would have been struck down because of unholiness or sin in their life, because they were they were they were presenting an offering without being clean. And then they would they had a rope and they would drag them out. And so there was this sacredness and this this um, reverence that they had about going into God's presence. But Zechariah has an encounter with an angel in the Holy of Holies. And this angel delivers a message to him. Now the thing was that Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth, Scripture tells us that they were righteous, that they followed the law, that they were good, upstanding people, but, but, it, but they had no children. Elizabeth was barren. And yet it was the deepest desire of their heart for them to be able to have a child. And so you can only imagine Zacharias is here offering the, the sacrifice on the altar for all of the Jewish people. And an angel comes in and interrupts, and the angel's message is this. Zachari, 
way, your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. So here's, here's where Zechariah might have felt pretty frightened. Because he was supposed to be praying for the Jewish people, not for himself. And yet the angel says, your prayer has been heard. Can I tell you, God knows what's in your heart. God knows the desires that are in your heart. We can't hide that from him. And the things that are in your heart, the desires, the prayers that you are offering up to the Lord, God cares about. And he wants to answer them. Sometimes we don't understand why or how he answers or doesn't answer or the timing of it. But God cares about the desires of your heart. And he's showing Zechariah this by sending this angel to this message. And Zechariah, of course, does what so many other people in the Bible do. Well, how are you going to do that, Lord? <laughs> right? Moses asked the same question. How are you going to do that, Lord? And the angel says, well, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go home. You're going to sleep with your wife. She's going to conceive a child. And you're going to be kept silent. God's not going to let him talk until after that child is born and it comes time to name the child. And you're going to name the child John which broke the custom because usually in the Jewish heritage, the boys would be named after the father. John is way different than Zachariah. <laughs> and yet this baby has a special assignment. And the angel says he's going to be moving in the power of Elijah and he's going to be the one to proclaim that the way of the Lord is coming, that the Lord is coming. So Zachariah and it's just a sacrifice. He goes home. He's with his wife. And lo and behold, I don't know why God likes to do this with old ladies, but Elizabeth <laughs> conceives a child. <laughs> Elizabeth conceives a child, and she's pregnant. And that's where we're going to jump into the story <clears throat> for Elizabeth. So that's happening with Zachariah and Elizabeth. We also have the Mary and, the, and Gabriel thing going on, okay? So Mary has been visited by the angel. She's been overcome by the Holy Spirit. And she's been told she's going to be the, the mother of the Savior of the world. And so Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. So let's see what happens. Because this just jumped out at me. You can even ask Nate. I was so amazed when I was reading this. So Luke chapter 1, verse 39. It says, At that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. You know, the, the revelation or the aha moment I had is actually very simple. But it was, it was a, the Lord did like a, a realignment. A calibration in my understanding. So after Easter, during the day of Pentecost, remember the apostles are all waiting in the upper room and praying. They're gathered together. It says there's about 120 people. And then the flame of fire and the wind comes in. And the promise that Jesus had given them to wait until the Holy Spirit would come, the Holy Spirit fell on them. And we talk about that all the time, right? We hear that story about what happens when the Holy Spirit comes and they're filled with the Spirit and they receive their heavenly praise languages. And it becomes a testimony and a witness to those outside. And then <clears throat> Peter preaches a sermon and 3,000 people get... Can you imagine the Holy Spirit coming in such a powerful way that people from all over the high desert begin to come to our church and 3,000 people get saved? Because this room is probably about the size of the upper room. So imagine what that would be like. And so we talk about the Holy Spirit 
from that moment on. But can I tell you, the Holy Spirit is present before Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is filling people before Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came to Elizabeth, one of the most unexpected, unassuming people that would be a candidate for the Holy Spirit. Think about this. She's old. She's been barren, which means she was not regarded in society as being anybody special. In fact, her reputation, here's the thing about what her reputation would have been like. Because she was the wife of a priest, but they had no children, people would have whispered behind their backs about what kind of hidden sin they probably had in their life. Because barrenness was viewed as a result of sin, not as just simply a biological situation. So this is somebody, she probably didn't have a lot of friends. She wasn't popular. She was past her prime. She was beyond what the doctors could do for her. And yet, look at this. God picks her as a candidate not only to be the mother of a forerunner for the Messiah, but to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When we look up the word filled, it means swollen. Okay? So... Here's, here's what I see. There's the physical picture of her being pregnant, right? Her belly would have been swollen. There's the spiritual picture of her being pregnant with the Spirit. That she has, the, she's filled, she's, she's filled, she's swollen, she's inflamed with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean for us to be filled with the Spirit? Is it just about the emotional, the spiritual picture that we get of Pentecost in the upper room? Yes, that's important. The signs and wonders and power of the Holy Spirit. How many of you need that in your life right now? I'm, I'm, I'm serious. How many of you need the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit? But here's the other thing. The Holy Spirit is not just an event. The Holy Spirit is a person who comes to live inside of us. It's part of the Godhead Trinity. Perfect in wisdom. Complete in power. Trustworthy in presence. The Holy Spirit. In Joel chapter 2, the promise had been given in the Old Testament. And this is what the people of Israel, God's children, were waiting for. Said, and afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Here's why this jumped out at me. I've known that Elizabeth was John the Baptist's mother. I've known that the baby leaped inside her womb. I've never seen before that she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you know, God wants to fill each and every one of us with the Holy Spirit. And our age and our status and our posture in life and our background does not matter in God's sight. God wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And he has planned to pour out his spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. Here's what I love about that. Do you see the reversal? Because usually it's the young people who have dreams about the future and the old people with the wisdom of life that have the vision. And here's where God turns it upside down. He says, no. You know what? The old people, the ones who are tired and worn down and used up, they're going to have dreams. Because guess what? If you're breathing, God's not done with you. Because if the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you have the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead living inside of you. So absolutely old people can dream dreams again. Amen. Your latter days will be better than your former days. That's what God's word says to you. And the wisdom of the Holy Spirit will be given out to the young people where they will be able to have the vision 
for what's to come, for what's new. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Men and women. An old, past her prime, barren woman who receives a miracle from God, who's carrying a forerunner for the Messiah, is filled, swollen, to the brim with the Holy Spirit of God. God is no respecter of person. God desires to fill you with the Holy Spirit. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. The Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Here's the hope that we have at Christmas time that goes beyond the lights, which I love, and the songs, and the food, and the presents. Do you know as believers in Jesus, the hope that we have at Christmas is to be filled with the Holy Spirit? And do we need the Holy Spirit right now? Amen. Yes. I need, I, in fact, it has been my prayer the last several weeks. I've just felt stirred up more than usual that I want more of the Holy Spirit in my life. Amen. Because I need the Holy Spirit in my life. I need what the Holy Spirit brings to my life. Here's some of what the Holy Spirit is for us today. This is straight out of Scripture. So John 14. And I just put the references so you can, you can study this during the week. But I want to read to you. This is not every verse about the Holy Spirit. This is just some of them. Holy, uh, John 14, 16 to 17 says this, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Megan, you have the Holy Spirit on your side. For everything life is throwing at you, the Holy Spirit's on your side right now. Fighting your battles. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him. But you know him, for he lives in you and will be in you. Do you realize that once you receive the Holy Spirit, you can't separate yourself from the Holy Spirit. You can ignore the Holy Spirit. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. You can try to run away from the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is in you. And Romans, like I said a few minutes ago, says this is the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead. That's the Spirit. Think about how many Christians are walking around not activated in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's like carrying, what's a pot? I, I would, it's carrying a detonation button, right? In your back pocket, but never pushing it. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, right? Like that's the dynamite power that Jesus promised us. We have that in us right now. Verses 26 and 27. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Are there things that you need to know for your life? Holy Spirit will teach those to you. Holy Spirit will teach you and remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. Okay, out of everything that Jesus has said, said to them, because this is common, this is how I would talk to somebody. Hey, Nate, I need you to go to the store and here's the grocery list but I really need you to get the milk, even though it's on the grocery list, right? Because I want him to know what the top priority is. So here's everything that Jesus has taught us. Everything that God wants us to know is in here. And yet, what does Jesus say? Jesus says, okay, Holy Spirit's going to bring up in your mind everything that I've taught you. Peace I give to you. It's like the milk on the grocery list. Jesus is saying, Holy Spirit's going to bring it up. If you're putting it in, Holy Spirit will bring it up. That's why we read God's word. That's why we spend time studying God's word, memorizing God's word, reading God's word. Is because it goes into us. Right? Do you remember what you had for breakfast yeah. two weeks ago on a Tuesday morning? Yeah. Well, <laughs> pretend you don't. <laughs> okay. For lunch three weeks ago on a Friday. 
Okay, we don't necessarily always remember what we've eaten, but did it nourish you? Yes. Did it feed you? Yes. Was it turned into vitamins in your body? Yes. That's why we read God's word. We may not always remember everything. We may not always understand everything. But as it goes into our spirit, the Holy Spirit, who lives inside of us, takes that word and turns it into spiritual nourishment for us. Takes that word and turns it into spiritual strength. Takes that word and turns it into faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17, I'm going to say it again. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So if you're struggling with faith, which is okay because we're human, if we're struggling with faith, we need to put more of God's word in. Okay? More of God's word. Even if we don't understand it, even if, even if we're wrestling with it, working through it, even if it's hard, we put it in because the Holy Spirit takes that word and turns it into faith. Turns it into strength. Turns it into hope. So, and the Holy Spirit will bring that up when we need it. The Holy Spirit will search through that mental filing cabinet and pull out what we need. But here's what Jesus said. Out of all of it, peace I give you. Peace I give you. My peace I give you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, nor be afraid. Here's something from the Holy Spirit for us this Christmas season. When the news is crazy, the stock markets are up and down, gas is super expensive, some of us don't know how we're going to pay our bills next month. Here's, here's what the Holy Spirit is doing with the Word of God, saying, Jesus said, peace I give you. Not as the world gives. Don't look, at, don't look to the world for your peace. Don't look to the world for your security. Don't look at the stock markets. Don't look at the gas prices. Don't look at the grocery store inflation. Look to Jesus. Peace I give you. Don't be discouraged. Don't be overwhelmed. And don't be afraid. <coughs> because I've overcome the world. That's what Jesus says to us. I've overcome the world. John 15. 26 to 27. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you must also testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. The Holy Spirit is our truth. There's so many things coming at us, right? This political thing, this medical thing, this news item, this Facebook thing, this friend said this, all these opinions, okay? We need truth. The Holy Spirit is our truth through the Word of God. The Holy Spirit will bring up the truth of the Word of God. Truth in the way of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is our truth. John 16, 13 to 14 says this. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. You know, the Holy Spirit will guide us and lead us and direct us and help us navigate things that we're going through. We do not have to go through the hard stuff alone. We do not have to try to figure out life on our own. We were not made to be alone. We were made to be in communion with God through the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's given us direction in his word, and the Holy Spirit activates his word in us <coughs> through revelation so that we are walking in the right way. And that's how we can live life, even when things are crazy outside, even when storms come into our life, even when we are faced with impossible situations. Holy Spirit lives in us to help us. We get power from the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about muscle power. We don't need muscle power. I'm not talking about emotional power where we just pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, right? And we just dig in and we just decide we're going to get through the day. No. I am talking about 
Holy Spirit power. I am talking about like I've been sitting across from the doctor when the doctor says you have cancer. How do you navigate that? You know how you navigate that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're still human. Okay, we have emotions and feelings and opinions and thoughts and experiences that all get flooded into our lives. But when the bill comes, when the prayer answer, when, when the answer to prayer takes a long time coming, and we're like, why is it taking so long, Lord? I'm praying for something good. I'm praying for something that's your will. And the answer isn't coming yet. How do we navigate that? We navigate that by the power of the Holy Spirit. Our advocate, our best friend right in our skin. That, that's advocate, parakletos, means Holy Spirit who is our advocate, who is our who's the one who is going to help us navigate things according to God's will. Okay, this doesn't mean we're not fighting with the Holy Spirit to try to do what's right. Holy Spirit helps us do what's right. Holy Spirit helps us walk righteously. Holy Spirit helps us walk faithfully. Holy Spirit helps us walk wisely. And guess what? Holy Spirit expects to do that. <laughs> We're not a burden. This is the way God made us. This is what God intended. When Jesus went back to heaven, that's why he said, I'm going to send the spirit. I'm going to leave my spirit with you. You're not orphans. Amen. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not abandoning you wow. to figure out life on your own. No, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit so that from now, from when Jesus left until he comes back and we're with him in heaven, that whole dash, that whole in-between time is all about us being in relationship with the Holy Spirit. Romans 8.2. This is getting into the nitty-gritty. Okay, this is there, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus... The law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So all that old garbage, all that old stuff we used to do before Jesus, that's still getting worked out through sanctification, through, through the process of learning to surrender to Jesus and be transformed by the renewing of our mind, that process of sanctification comes through the Holy Spirit. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the separating out of the old, the old self, the old man, the old ways, the before Jesus stuff, right? Some of us still have to work that out. And that's okay because that's the job of the Holy Spirit, to work that out. That's how, we, that's how salvation, the truth of salvation gets worked out in our life through the Holy Spirit. And you know what? The Holy Spirit will be as much of your best friend in that as you let him. We can try to muscle our way through regeneration and transformation and sanctification. But you know what? It doesn't happen that way. It happens by surrendering and allowing the Holy Spirit to work. Giving ourselves over to the Holy Spirit. How about prayer? Okay, let's, let's be super honest. How many of you have times when you don't know how to pray about something? You don't have words. I do. Okay? Guess what? Holy Spirit prays for us <coughs> perfectly. Perfect prayers. Perfect to the will of God. Holy Spirit prays for us. We're not alone in even praying about our stuff that goes on. Holy Spirit is praying for us with groanings too deep for words. I think about some of the hardest times and seasons of my life when I literally, all I could do was like, barely make a sound, right? Not even words. My spirit was groaning, right? Through some of the hardest seasons of my life. And yet, you know what happens in those moments is the Holy Spirit is praying. You are never alone. Can I say that? You're never alone. The Holy Spirit is faithful, faithful to pray according to the will of God. Whether you have your spiritual prayer language like you're praying in tongues or whether you're, you're silently 
offering yourself over to the Lord in prayer, the Holy Spirit's praying for you. He does his job. He doesn't sleep on the clock. <laughs> Isn't that good? He doesn't sleep on the clock. We have wisdom, 1 Corinthians 2, 12. The spirit that, that God has given us is not like the spirit of the world, but is a spirit that lets us know the things that God has freely given us. Like peace and joy, freedom, strength, faith, all those things that come from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives us fruit, patience, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, self-control. If you need any of that, that's, it comes from the Spirit. It doesn't come from us gritting our teeth and hoping somebody doesn't see what our face is doing. I do that sometimes. <laughs> I turn my back so people can't see what my face is yelling at them, right? <laughs> but Holy Spirit helps us with that. Those areas of our life where we fall short. Our personality, our characteristic, our traits. Our tendencies, right? We all we all fall short in one way or another. Holy Spirit helps us have the fruit that is pleasing to God, and that ex it exemplifies the Spirit of Jesus, who God really is to others. Romans eight fourteen, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Your identity comes from the Holy Spirit. When you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. You belong to him. Period. You know, during an adoption ceremony in the courtroom, the judge will read a declaration that this child that's being adopted by these parents, this child has all of the inalienable rights of inheriting what the what the parents life has to offer that child and so it's the same way with God because of Jesus you've been adopted into God's family you can't break that bond. like you can't break that bond you here's the thing you might decide to walk away like the prodigal son did but your last name is not going to change Your last name is not that you've been adopted into the family of God. You have full access to all the inheritance. You are a joint heir with Christ. Think about what Christ will inherit. Scripture says you're a joint heir with Christ. Seated in the heavenly places. So your spiritual position, here's the thing that gets hard for us. Your spiritual position because of Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead your spiritual position is as a joint heir with Christ in heaven, seated in heavenly places. Your earthly position is that dash, okay? We're still walking it out. <laughs> still walking it out. The in, be the in between. Some of the, uh, <laughs> That's how it feels most days. Oh, okay, Lord, help me. When, when, when do I get there? Okay? He knows that. But spiritually, you've been seated with Christ in the heavenly places. That's in Ephesians. Let me read Ephesians 5 to close it up. Ephesians 5, 18 to 20 says this. It says, do not get drunk on wine. That's always good anyways. <laughs> which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So here's the thing. Be filled with the Spirit. Scripture teaches us this is a continual state of being. Okay? So we get filled with the Spirit when we get saved, but we have the opportunity to constantly be coming back to the Lord saying, I want more of you. Yeah. I want more of you. I want more. And you know what? He doesn't walk away and be like, nah, only one free refill. He says, okay, you want more? I'm going to give you more of the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's the full circle. 
Here's the full circle of this story. Did you see what Elizabeth did after she was filled with the Spirit? Okay, let's go back to Luke chapter 1. This is so, I think this is really where it makes, like, where the collision happens. Okay, Luke chapter 1. Verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. <clears throat> we just read in Ephesians, be filled with the Spirit, and then with your mouth, sing, make joyful proclamations, praise the Lord, speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So, here's Journey for Square Church's homework assignment for Christmas season. Are you ready? Okay? I'm going to speak like the apostles did. I charge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, be filled with the Spirit and then speak in the Spirit this Christmas season. Be filled with the Spirit. Seek the Holy Spirit. Go to God and ask him to give you more of the Holy Spirit. Say, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And then with your mouth, Make joyful sound. With your mouth, speak to one another encouragement. With your mouth, praise the Lord. Give thanksgiving. With your mouth, make him known. With your mouth, give him glory. With your mouth, testify of what he's done for you. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. That's in Psalms. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Be noisy with your praise this Christmas season because you're filled with the Spirit. So two parts. Be filled with the Spirit. And by being filled with the Spirit, I mean make yourself available to God. Ask God. Okay? I'm saying this in faith. Because some of you, I know, you want it and you feel like it hasn't been happening. Because you've been praying or you've been asking and stuff hasn't changed. So, <laughs> this is on the Lord. <laughs> but you're faithful, God. Amen. He's faithful. Amen. So go to the Lord and ask him for more of the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And then with your mouth. With your mouth, bless. With your mouth, praise. With your mouth, give thanksgiving. With your mouth, encourage. With your mouth, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Make him known. And if you have to start with the testimony that he woke you up today, okay? Then start there. If you have to start with the testimony that you had a bed to sleep in, if you have to start with the testimony that you ate a meal, if you have to start with the testimony that you had gas in your car, if you have to start with the testimony that you have health, that you're alive, wh wherever the starting point is, let that be your starting point, and then come back and say, Holy Spirit, fill me again. Fill me again. He will fill you. He will fill you. And church, I'm telling you, God's setting us up because there's some stuff that's going to happen in January. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a limb. Okay, we've, we've been walking through some hard stuff as a church family. Each family in this church has been going through hard trials. Okay? That is the perfect scenario for the Holy Spirit to come and blow the walls off your life. Amen. Because we get desperate. And when the people get desperate for more of the Holy Spirit... That, that invites, that there's like a, there's something that happens where God is like, okay, they want me, right? Not because of the blessing, not because of the comfort, not because it's easy, but because we want him.
So I'm going to encourage you, be filled with the Spirit this season. And then with your mouth, speak in the Spirit, praise in the Spirit. Amen. Okay. So let's gather up in the front. We're going to do something a little different. We, we saw this happen. We're going to kind of circle up, and we're going to give the blessing in a circle. <laughs> huh? You want to do it? Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, we're going to gather together for a reason. So you hear us Sunday after Sunday. Come on, man. Well, come on up. There is room. Come on up. So we talk about, you hear us every Sunday talk about, and I'm going to step down. Uh, I'm not going to get up on the stage. Uh, we talk Sunday after Sunday. We give the blessing. But it's, it's kind of like picking up on what Pastor Christie was talking about today. Uh, when we accept Christ, we are adopted in. Jesus himself said we were grafted into the vine. The vine being the Jewish people who were original, the, the original recipients of that promise. So as we reach for the original recipient, as we reach for what that original promise looked like, it's the blessing. When we talk about how the Lord blesses you and keeps you, think about what that means. The Lord is going to pour his blessings into your life before you ask. He is going to keep you. He's going to keep you safe. He's going to keep you comforted. When, and he's going to do it before you see it. Before, before you see where your problem's headed, he already has your solution planned out. Mm. Okay. He is going to make his face shine upon you. Whatever darkness you are facing right now, his face is going to shine a light into it. And he is doing it before we see it. That's what his promise looks like. He is going to be gracious to you. Those things that you lack, those things that you want, God sees. And he is going to pour that into you, press down, overflowing. When he raises, when he lifts his countenance to you, think about the times when you're fearful, when you're afraid, when you don't know what's going to happen. See, when he lifts his countenance, he is pouring court courage into you. When your face is down, he lifts his countenance to you. Raise your face up because you are a child of the Most High King. And then everything that we worry about, he will give you peace. So all of that is wrapped up in the blessing. So when we send you out every Sunday with that blessing, May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Lift his countenance to you. Be gracious to you and give you peace. So with that, we say that together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our church says as one. Amen. Amen.